unfortunately got a lot of thoughts inside your head that aren't yours. Because you think in the English language, and that was given to you by other people, and contains their prejudices, that you can't avoid them in thinking. Japanese people will say that when they think in Japanese, they can have certain feelings that are characteristically Japanese. But when they start thinking in English, they can't have those feelings. And so uh, you are very, very much really in the sphere of public influence when you, th when you start to think. And if you listen carefully to your thoughts, insofar as they are uttered in words, and they very often are, uh, try and discover the tone of voice in which certain of your thoughts are being said, and you will listen and hear your mother, or you will hear an aunt, or you will hear a school teacher, or you will hear certain friends expressing their opinions and telling you who you are and how you ought to behave. And you think those are your thoughts and they're nothing of the kind. An inner pandemonium under the dome of the skull is going on all the time. Myriads of voices, myriads of influences from outside working upon you, even when you are physically quite alone. So, wait till the question period, please. Um, <clears throat> this means that you are not nearly as much of a private individual as you think. You are also, of course, exercising these influences upon other people. You're telling them who they are, what you think about them, what you think of their behavior. And even if they don't believe you, they nevertheless pay very serious attention to it. They can't help it. You can take the experiment, for example, that B.F. Skinner used to try, which is very terrifying. He would send two members of the class selected arbitrarily outside of the room. Then he would arrange two chairs, chair A and chair B. He would say to the class, now look, when these people come back, we're going to engage them in a conversation. Whatever A says, agree with him. Whatever B says, disagree with him. So they come back into the room and they take their seats and the conversation begins. Now B may be a very strong-headed, articulate person, and A really rather feeble. But what happens is this that by group agreement with anything A says, he is encouraged, he is built up, he becomes more articulate, he finds himself uh, sprouting. But B, by being disagreed with on every point, begins to get baffled and confused and uh, feel very uncomfortable indeed. Unless he is onto the game and he challenges the whole group, I see now what you're playing. You have made up your minds to disagree with everything I say. Therefore, of course, you don't count. <laughs> I shall pay no attention to you. <laughs> so, in this way, you see, we're already uh, colossally influenced by each other. And this is why I think that Harry Stack Sullivan's basic ideas about psychopathology are in some respects more profound than Freud's. Freud is always looking into the individual history, into the uh, physiology, into the depth psychology of the individual in an interior sort of way. But Sullivan was always looking to the individual as the expression of a social network. And the same in the psychology of George Herbert Mead, where he called uh, the conceptions that we have of ourselves, the interiorized other. In other words, the sum total of all the things that people have told us we are. Because you do not know yourself as a self, except in a society. Just as you do not exist biologically without a father and a mother, you do not carry on an existence without a society, and the reactions of other people to you provide you with the mirror in which you attain a realization of yourself. You know who you are in terms of your relationships with others. 
So then now, uh, when we contemplate this disappearance of privacy and a completely integrated human society, we can look at this from two different points of view, pro and con. Let us first look at the pro point of view. How great to have nothing to hide. How great to give up all worries about ownership. Because you can say, if somebody says uh, they would like something you have, and you say, please, have it. Because you know very well, you can go to someone else and say, could I have that? And uh, they'll give it to you. And uh, so all the way around, uh, there, there is no propriety, in the sense not of um, prudish propriety, but propriety in the sense of possession. Also, of course, in the sense of prudish propriety. Uh, nobody has any dirty little secrets, because if I have any dirty secrets, uh, I know very well that you have too, and so let's drop the whole pretense and uh, <coughs> let go. Uh, so in this sense, there might be a very, very close fellowship between all people, in which uh, there are no barriers, no defenses, and we all uh, cooperate together beautifully and love each other. Now, uh, let's look at the con point of view. Con point of view would say, yes, but uh, surely the more we communicate with each other in that way and have no property and there are no boundaries and there are no fences or defenses then just in the same way that jet aircraft makes all cities the same city so this would make all people the same individual would that be what the Hindus mean by saying you are all one you are all the Godhead in disguise would it mean that Uh, now, part of our difficulty in approaching this is that we begin from the standpoint of a certain conception of the individual person. And this is, of course, the Christian ego, uh, which is the soul as a center of action and uh, something alive with consciousness and intelligence that lies hidden in the bag of skin. As, for example, King John says in Shakespeare's play to Hubert, within this wall of flesh there is a soul counts thee her creditor, and with advantage means to pay thy love. See the image? Within this wall of flesh there is a soul. Within the castle there is the king. And every man's home is his castle. And so, those of us who are brought up in that way, to feel, A, that we are basically the soul in the body, and B, that every soul that exists is of infinite value in the eyes of God. We, therefore, have instituted, since the Industrial Revolution, a tremendous technological campaign to preserve the individual. We have all kinds of social services, hospitals, ambulances, medicine, uh, welfare agencies, every kind of thing with the one aim of preserving life, getting you to live longer, and giving what is called full opportunity for the development of your personality to the myriads of Asia. This is... Uh, almost unbelievable. And then, of course, we are teaching the peoples of Asia medicine and uh, sanitation, industrialization, so that uh, every single coolie child can be regarded not as so much waste human material, which because it's sick has to be thrown away, but as some individual to be loved and cherished and properly treated. And uh, because individuality, the human, the, the particular, each particular human organism is infinitely precious. 
that is the moving ideal of the sort of people who first created uh, the great hospitals, who abolished slavery, who abolished the death penalty for trivial offenses, who made that great humanitarian movement of the 19th century associated with such people as Wesley and Charles Dickens and Wilberforce and so on uh, to rescue the precious individual from the ravages of impersonal disease or impersonal political exploitation. Then when uh, a kind of American capitalist liberalism achieved to some extent this sort of ideal, we look then at political forms which are socialistic or communistic and are leery of them because they seem to go back on all that. So, of course, did National Socialism in Germany. Because the position there is it is not the individual who is the supremely important being, but it is the community, the state, which is supremely important. The individual realizes himself as a servant of the state. But our theory in the liberal capitalism of the United States is that the state is the servant of the individual. That we employ policemen and soldiers and sanitary inspectors and uh, Department of Commerce officials, all to serve us. We call them public servants. And when a policeman gets uppish, he has to be reminded that we pay his salary and that his job is to serve us and not to be a kind of uh, admirable Crichton sort of butler who takes the upper hand. But of course the very idea of a servant still calls it, has in it, doesn't it, something aristocratic. And as we all know, in this country it is increasingly difficult to get services of any kind. More and more it is felt beneath the individual's dignity to be, say, a waiter, a barber. After all, they give you a certain kind of service. Certainly, it's beneath anyone's dignity to shine shoes, because that's the feet, and that's very low down. It's like kissing people's feet. Uh, to give massage, to uh, do all these things for other people that, you know, that are rather material skills. Increasingly, you have to get them in another way, either by a do-it-yourself system or by some sort of machinery. And so in the same way, people who used to give service want to translate themselves professionally. People who were formerly called undertakers now call themselves morticians. Uh, janitors call themselves maintenance services. Uh, I suppose barbers will soon call themselves tonsorial experts. Uh, all sorts of things like that are, going to, uh, are happening right now in order to give the sense of equality all round. 